Okay, good afternoon and good evening to those of you in Europe and good morning to those of you in Australia and Asia. Welcome to the closing plenary session of the ESIG 2021 Meteorology and Market Design for Grid Services Workshop on the second half of the Texas event on energy adequacy and market design. We've come full circle now, starting the workshop a month ago with the meteorology and climatology of the Texas event. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As I think you know by now, our workshop sessions are all being held online and are open to everyone. And I do want to let you know that we're planning our first major in-person event since the COVID outbreak last year with the Fall Technical Workshop in, of all places, Austin, Texas, during the week of October 25th. Please mark your calendars and look for additional information in the near future. The workshop was planned with the input of our ESIG Offerings Committee, chaired by Bethany Fru of NREL and Julia Matoivasan of ERCOT. The committee consists of the chairs of our six working groups and several of our board members. We have a great set of volunteers who really make ESIG what it is, and we encourage you to become involved if you're not already. You can find us on the web at esig.energy, send an email to info at esig.energy to get our monthly newsletter, and follow our activities on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. ESIG also serves a leadership role in the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, often called GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors from around the world to catalyze a rapid clean energy transition at unprecedented scope and scale. ESIG leads one of the five pillars that deals with the research agenda for the system operators. More information on GPST can be found at globalpst.org. Regarding logistics for today, I'd ask you to note that the closing plenary session will be two hours long. We had a lot of feedback that our one hour workshop sessions were too rushed. So we've moved to some longer formats for this workshop. We'll have five individual presentations during the first part of the session, followed by a robust discussion and Q and A period after the last presentation. As we're doing with all of our webinars now, we'll be using the Slido platform for managing the Q&A. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter ESIG29, ESIG29, as the event code to ask your questions. Please be sure to indicate the person to whom you're addressing the question. The instructions are also at the bottom of the background slide for the webinar, and you'll be reminded by the session chair. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the question on Slido to allow you to vote on prioritizing the questions submitted. So please keep the questions coming during the presentations and we'll address them at the end. We'll follow up with written answers to any questions we don't get to during the Q&A. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with more than 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted. So again, we ask you to use the Slido platform to ask your questions with ESIG29 as the event code. Today's session is titled Energy Adequacy and Market Design. The Texas event part two. As you may recall, as I said earlier, the opening plenary session at the beginning of the month covered the climatology and meteorology of the February Texas event this past winter. And today we'll be looking at the resource adequacy and market design aspects up one side and down the other. These are topics affecting everyone experiencing the transition of the resource mix from a conventional mix to one dominated by variable renewables and storage. We have a fine lineup of practitioners and participants from across the spectrum today who explore different aspects of this topic, and I'm looking forward to a great session and discussion. The session will be chaired by Eric Ela of EPRI. Eric is a well-known figure in the system planning, electricity markets, and operations space. He now serves as a project manager at EPRI, where he's been for seven years, leading EPRI's electricity markets research after spending time at both NREL and the New York ISO. Eric received his PhD in EE from UC Dublin, working with Professor Mark O'Malley, but we won't hold that against him. Eric is a co-chair of our System Operations and Market Design Working Group at ESIC and contributes to our Hybrid Plant and DER Task Force. He's a good friend, a regular contributor to ESIC activities, and is well known to many of you. He brings a lot of good experience and insight to the topic of our session today, and we're very happy to have him here with us. Eric, we appreciate your participation and I'll now turn it over to you. All right, thanks so much for that introduction, Charlie. 
Uh, we've got a great session for everybody today. Uh, as Charlie mentioned, um, we did have a, a really good session earlier in the month uh, talking about uh, resource adequacy issues um, and looking at what techniques or tools can be used to help forecast and, and model these types of um, events that are impacting um, resource adequacy, uh, such as uh, those that we experienced in, in, uh, in uh, February uh, earlier this year. Uh, so is this annual uh, eSIG forecasting workshop uh, that, that happens uh, each year in June has evolved over the years. We've been, begun to include uh, more and more sort of beyond forecasting, but what do you do with forecasting operations, how markets uh, function on um, and, and integrating uh, new technologies and so forth. So it is fitting uh, to kind of talk about the topic of resource adequacy from this market design and, and reliability uh, perspective to sort of close out the uh, the June uh, series of, uh, of sessions uh, with this topic today. So we've got a great panel, uh, some well-known panelists, experts discussing resource adequacy, uh, how it may be um, evolving uh, to factor in some of the changes that we've seen to the system, uh, including um, decarbonization, including um, impacts of, uh, of, e of climate events and other uh, types of events. Um, it gives some specific experiences uh, from some recent events, uh, again, like we saw last February in Texas and the Midwest uh, and, and others such as last summer and even maybe some of uh, some uh, things that are happening now um, in, in out there in the West and the Northwest in particular. Um, uh, looking at resource adequacy, uh, how to better link uh, things to resource adequacy, such as transmission, uh, fuel delivery, like the natural gas system. Um, and then, of course, discussing solutions, uh, such as market design solutions or other solutions uh, to help achieve resource adequacy and prevent uh, these types of events from causing large scale damage in the future. Um, so um, uh, without um, uh, too much else, I'd like to get right to the panel. So as Charlie mentioned, uh, we're going to have uh, five um, presentations, say, or, or, or discussions that the five panelists will lead uh, about 15 minutes each. And uh, we might have time for, you know, one question, clarifying question, if we find a unique one in there to, to get, but we'll, we'll definitely have uh, maybe hopefully at least 30 minutes at the end for a larger uh, Q&A. So uh, just a reminder there uh, on the chat, you can see the, the Slido uh, link and the code. Uh, keep those questions coming in. And if you have specific ones for specific uh, speakers, uh, make sure to mention that. Uh, if you have some broader questions, uh, you can mention that as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Mark Lauby. Uh, who is a senior vice president and chief engineer uh, at uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Uh, he joined NERC in January of 2007 and has held a number of positions, including vice president, uh, director of uh, standards, and, and as well as vice president uh, and director of reliability assessments and performance analysis. Uh, Mark also served as chair and, and a life member of the International Electric research uh, exchange and served as chair of a number of various uh, IEEE working groups uh, and he earned his bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from University of Minnesota. Um, so Mark uh, you should have uh, I think control of your slides now and uh, look forward to your uh, presentation. Well thank you Eric and I want to thank ESIG as well for holding this uh, wonderful panel and I look forward to chatting uh, about energy uh, you know, sufficiency and how really how we're seeing this change occurring and and so the, my deck is really uh, focused on a an activity that NERC has spun up, which really kind of parallels what we're what we saw in Texas, but we've also seen in California, we've seen in uh, New England and a few other locations and uh, and what we're and, and and how we need to be thinking about changing in the way in which we plan the system. Uh, operationalize the system in a planning realm and as well as then perhaps operate the system. So in this case, I'm talking about the Energy Reliability Assessment Task Force. And, and, and the reason why this is important is because in the past, we thought about uh, resource adequacy from a capacity perspective. And the capacity, of course, then was a wonderful way uh, to get us across the, uh, across the uh, transom on 
sufficiency in, in a number of areas. Uh, and, and I'll chat a little bit more about that uh, when I get to the next slide. Uh, and I hope it will move. There we go. So the bottom line, and it's something I guess we really hadn't really thought about a lot, though, it, I, I think that our Canadian colleagues who have been dealing with hydro over the many years, and as well as folks started getting more and more engaged with variable energy resources, is that we need to have sufficient amounts of energy to meet energy needs of the end-use consumer, essentially at all times. And we generally ensured those energy requirements solely through really capacity and reserve margins. And because, you know, in the end, when we had that capacity and we didn't have a variable, uh, variability in the energy, uh, uh, then we got that energy, uh, as well as, by the way, we also got ancillary services and flexibility, and then that ensured uh, uh, you might say uh, resource efficiency or certainly energy sufficiency. And now, now that with this grid transformation, uh, we're really seeing a higher level of uncertainty, regardless of fuel type. And and it really comes down to that we're trans, I say, transforming to a grid that has more sensitive to extreme events. And when I talk about extreme events here, I want to be very clear that I'm not talking about tornadoes and hurricanes and derechos, where we have a, an immense amount of experience. Many times the bulk electric system is not uh, as damaged as the distribution system, and we have mutual aid, and we work hard as an industry to bring things back uh, up after those storms hit and leave. I'm talking more here around long-term, uh, long-duration, extreme temperatures, uh, potentially wind droughts and solar droughts, which can be exacerbated by those temperatures or weather. And so we're trans I think we're transitioning to a, 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 a resource mix that's more sensitive to those kinds of common conditions, which can result in the loss of substantial amount of resources, unless, of course, we uh, take advantage of our knowledge of what we need to do to ensure that those resources are available uh, when we need them during these extreme uh, temperature events or, again, a different set of extreme natural events than those perhaps that uh, uh, we've had to worry about in the past. And what might be driving that, one can talk about climate change, one can say, well, we've always had those cold years every 10 years or so, whatever, it is a resource mix now that's evolving to that. And we need to learn uh, from our experience and, and, and start thinking about really, what are some of the rules of thumb that we've been using, the one event in 10? Does that really mean anything anymore? Or should we really be thinking about, well, what are my energy needs? What are my auxiliary service needs? What's my flexibility needs? And then back away from that to understand the kind of capacity mix that will get us to where we need to go. And so those rules of thumb may be actually, when you think about how electrification is occurring across North America and the 400 million people that really uh, count on our industry, uh, um, that one in 10 may be uh, something we need to think uh, a little bit more around one in 15 or one in, one in 20, and, and think about what the implications are from an energy perspective, ancillary services, and flexibility. What kind of resources are going to get us to where we need to go? So recognizing that, of course, we worked with a number of folks within the industry and, 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 uh, and laid out uh, kind of, well, what, what are the kind of time frames to be considering here? And, you know, as, as you start thinking of resource mixes and construction, of course, that has accelerated, especially with renewable energies being much easier to build, but even gas turbines sometimes up to five years, maybe a little bit less. So we do have some time there to build out. But, of course, understanding what are some of the rules of thumbs that we've been using in the past, some of those are valid. You need to have capacity to get the energy, but you may need more or different types of capacity to get to the energy needs that you have. And that may include diverse diversity, transactions, demand response, a host of other tools in, in the toolkit here to get there. And of course, then season ahead, I like to think more than just one year ahead, but what's my emergency uh, plan in the upcoming for the upcoming season when I, if I see some of these events, how I'm going to manage my generation mix, how am I going to serve load that if I don't serve it impacts the reliable operation of the bulk electric system. We saw that recently, uh, for example, with some of the uh, critical uh, infrastructure loads not being served, be it communications or gas uh, loads. 
And of course, then operations, you know, how do we make sure we're ready for the next hour uh, considering the challenges we have. But the whole idea is hopefully get to a point where we don't have this kind of emergency uh, challenges that in the end we had to face in Texas. How do we get to a point where we don't see uh, that problem as much or we are able to manage or mitigate the impacts? So this it was an understanding of this activity because, uh, because of what we've been seeing uh, in, in, like I said, in, in New England and in California and a number of other folks. We saw it also in, 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 in uh, Louisiana and that area, uh, uh, I would say south of MISO, perhaps in uh, 2018. We saw, uh, uh, of course, the loss of the wind when it got, uh, you know, very, very cold. Uh, and, and, and so, and, and that of course exacerbated issues in the north because there was an anticipated that we'd lose those resources. So learning from all of those things and how do we do a better job perhaps of, of planning and, and, and operationally uh, operating, uh, planning and operationally uh, a better uh, plan ahead of time. So of course defining what our study should be, what should we be looking at. Uh, it's a little bit different perhaps than the kind of the traditional N minus one generating plant. Uh, when we have a common condition that can take out maybe two times of the largest uh, plants that we have uh, over an extended period of time. So we need to start thinking about those kind of contingencies and what do we want to design to and what do we want to recover from. Uh, and of course, that that's whole idea is that it takes us down this road of what I'll call design basis. Uh, and, and we're really going to need a kind of good, hard thought way of moving forward on what are expected unserved energy, for example, levels that we find acceptable, uh, if that's going to be the number uh, uh, which help drive the kind of capacity mix that we want, or what are what are some of the different types of tools that we need, uh, be it if we're looking at multiple infrastructures as well. So there were 11 questions that we developed. We developed a white paper actually working with industry uh, uh, and, and ensuring en energy adequacy with energy constrained resources. It was ongoing over the last few years. Uh, 11 questions were asked. They were really uh, then kind of focused into three areas. One, the energy adequacy and flexibility for evolving resource mix, gas delivery security, which is uh, not meant to be a cyber security, but security in the sense of, of uh, I'll say, energy sufficiency. And then an area called uh, metrics and procedures, which were actually kind of Okay, once we've been able to figure out focus area one and two, maybe we start looking at. So we're not doing a deep dive in those areas. But this group, by the way, this task force stands ready to support the results of the ongoing FERC ERO enterprise inquiry, which is ongoing. So I, I can't speculate necessarily what the actions are going to be from that particular effort, though I know it is ongoing. They gathered their, their data and are doing some analysis and working with, uh, with industry as well to see what the lessons learned are and what some of the actions are going to be. But looking at focus area one, it, really what is the mix of resources uh, that are going to get us to where we need to uh, be, as uh, where we want to be, given the decarbonization that we're, we're looking for, given the uh, de decentralization, which will result from this, as well as, of course, then, uh, you know, making sure that we get to a, an energy efficient uh, uh, result, a decarbonized world that we're, we aspire to. What, is that, what does that look like? And, and as I mentioned here, a peak hour capacity, which used to be the one driver for that one event in 10, really doesn't mean as much when you're looking at common conditions. We're not looking at random equipment failure here, where you lose a unit because there was a random equipment failure or pulverizer or whatever. We're looking at common conditions over a widespread area, which we are sensitive to. So what do we need to do from an operational planning perspective to be ready? Uh, and also, and when we plan the system to ensure that we have a robust system uh, that can withstand uh, these kinds of events, which we're going to see more and more of. And of course, ensuring that we have the kind of flexibility we need to offset ramps that are going to potentially occur uh, unexpectedly, perhaps uh, during, the, uh, during the day, uh, if, for example, a snowfall happens that we didn't expect or, 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 or uh, you know, if, if it's a wildfire impact or cloud cover that appears. Uh, unexpectedly as well. The uh, second focus area, of course, this really, really uh, a lot of interest in how we deliver gas. As you know, the gas system itself wasn't necessarily built uh, 
So there's some parts in, in North America, certainly in Florida, where gas systems were built to serve uh, natural gas systems or gas generating plants. But generally, uh, uh, there, uh, there's a, a host of different other loads that they've been built for and, and uh, the support. And, and now, we need, now we have this rather heavy dependence on, on the uh, gas system to support uh, natural gas, when, uh, when, especially when other resources are not available. And interestingly enough, of course, they're counting on electricity sometimes to winterize their loads. So how do we ensure that uh, that uh, their winterization is not offset by by being interrupted? And of course, once you have that interruption, it takes a long time uh, to be able to uh, bring them back online. It's not one of those things where you just turn on and off. So um, understanding what are some of the implications of the gas system and the electric systems and how they're becoming more and more dependent how do we ensure that certain parts of that system are going to remain uh, supportive of the energy sufficiency needs? And some of that will have to do with unit winterization, I'm sure. Uh, some of that will have to do with winterization of the uh, gas system as well as some of the, as I mentioned before, some of, of the other types of things around plants being operating regimes and what have you. So the task force, I just wanted to make sure that you could get to the scope. You can click on that and find out what their, you know, their, uh, uh, their scope is, which, of course, is laid out here along with a few location, volatility, of forecasted load, and make recommendations to the Reliability Security Te uh, Technical Committee. They're coordinating with a lot of other committees. There is an electric gas working group. There's a reliability assessment subcommittee. Uh, there is uh, one group that focuses slowly. DER, which is connected to the distribution system, how to manage all that. And of course, they stand ready now also to uh, support uh, the actions that will come out of the uh, FERC uh, ERO enterprise uh, uh, inquiry. Uh, the results, I, I understand, are around the November timeframe, though uh, we are, are working with industry to uh, have put together some stopgap activities uh, in the coming months for the upcoming winter. So that happy to take any quick questions. Otherwise, I uh, I ask uh, uh, Eric to take on uh, the, the the next speaker. Really delighted again to be here and uh, happy to and look forward to the uh, I'm sure probing and 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 interesting discussion from the panel. Thank you, Eric. Great. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, I think we'll just move on to the the next speaker for now, and then um, keep uh, providing some questions on Slido. Uh, there on the link using the code that uh, was sent on the chat window there um, and um, also make sure to, to add um, any information on who the question was for broad, broadly or, or individually and so forth. I think there's a few comments on there but I didn't really see any questions yet so uh, keep them coming uh, but uh, let's uh, move on to our uh, second speaker uh, today, so uh, we're, we're glad to have Beth Garza uh, with us today, who is a senior fellow with uh, R Street's Energy and Environmental Policy Team. Uh, prior to R Street, Beth served as the director of ERCOT's uh, Independent Market Monitor from 2014 through 2019, uh, after serving as the deputy director uh, ever since uh, 2008. Uh, in that role, she was responsible for monitoring market participant activity, uh, evaluating wholesale market operations and recommending improvements to wholesale market design. Um, over the course of her 35 year career in the utility industry, uh, Beth has held a variety of leadership roles in uh, generation and transmission planning, system operations, regulatory affairs, and market design for both regulated and uh, competitive entities. Uh, previous employers include NextEra on, and Austin Energy. Uh, Beth is a graduate of uh, University of Missouri and a reg registered professional engineer in the state of Texas. Uh, Beth uh, is going to give us, uh, I think, a, a good overview of some of the uh, challenges uh, associated with uh, gas electric uh, coordination and just some general uh, topics around um, sort of the national natural gas uh, interface with electricity and uh, I think might comment a little bit on uh, some of the uh, particular issues from uh, from Texas perspective as well. So uh, uh, Beth, uh, we're glad to have you here and uh, I think you should have control of the, the slides. Excellent. 
And Eric, if you can just give me a thumbs up that I'm coming. Well, you've disappeared. I, I'm going to assume that I'm I'm heard, and I uh, want to thank uh, Esig for the opportunity to uh, to be here and share some perspectives uh, from right here, deep in the heart of Texas. So um, I, I'm in Austin, Texas, and and lived through the event in February, and so uh, many many of. Uh, uh, many of my comments are colored by the 80 hours I spent in the cold and dark as well. So um, I, I wanted to start with this slide uh, because it th these are kind of my simple explanations. You know, the standard question, what went wrong? Well, these are my simple explanations and, and it's more comprehensive than the topics I want to hit on today. And but you see the 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 this interaction between electricity and natural gas and and that really picks up on um, kind of that second area of focus that Mark described his task force working on and so this interestingly in Texas um, you know 50 years ago I'm not that old I wasn't here then but 50 years ago uh you know all electricity gen was generated by natural gas and you know we're here in the midst of of a long you know active development and er, exploration and production of of natural gas and oil resources you know many of which we used uh, were developed and designed and many of the power plants were built to to draw on those resources so so what is it that's happened that that has uh, made that relationship more challenging going forward. Um, you know, this slide here, I it, it was trying to come up, it, it, they, the two areas, the two um, industries are completely or increasingly interdependent on each other. Um, you know, natural gas is the largest uh, fuel input to generation resources. And I have some charts I'll show uh, to, to describe that. Um, one of the things I don't know and would be interested to find out is the inverse of that is, you know, from a, some, you know, whether it's a Texas specific or regional basis or national basis, you know, how big a share of revenues to the gas industry is provided from electricity generation. Uh, interesting question. I, I just pose it out there and would would welcome any insights uh, anybody might have on that question. Um, both markets interact with each other and provide financial opportunities for the other. And, and what do I mean by that? It's, you know, there are opportunities to buy natural gas forward. There's opportunities to buy electricity on a forward basis and then potentially sell each of, you know, sell some of that back if at real time, if that makes sense. Um, one of the differences is this, um, uh, and the, uh, you know, one of the things, one of the concerns that we hear about during the event was the, you know, gas facilities were not able, were not fully, um, didn't have all of their electricity needs fully met. They were, you know, they didn't have enough electricity to keep their, their facilities warm and operational. Um, and that's a shift, you know, uh, whether that's electricity for heat tape or whether it's this uh, industry transformation on the gas side, whereas pipeline compressors used to be fed by, you know, basically natural gas, uh, you know, fed off of the pipeline, you know, the, the source of that the pipeline was carrying itself. Um, that is, is less common now. And most compressors on pipeline, my understanding is most compression, compression on natural gas pipelines are electric motors. So again, increasing that interdependence. Back to the market thing, though. Um, you know, one of the if if elect one of the issues where natural gas facilities were unable to uh, deliver or transport because of lack of electricity. Um, there's at least some anecdotal evidence that some of that lack of electricity was by their choice, either by um, virtue of the wholesale power agreement or the retail electricity purchased by natural gas facilities um, and the capability to kind of sell that power back at very high real-time prices. Um, that's, that's a 
that that's not a bug. That's a feature of markets. That that's what they're intended to do. But as, um, uh, as things were in the very cold and uh, icy conditions that we were under, the inability to kind of restart from those interruptions was was uh, troubling on both both sides, both electricity and gas. The other key difference that I think arose certainly during February or became more apparent during February was the um, the two industries have different concepts of what force majeure is, and um, uh, natural gas uh, suppliers seem to be able to declare force majeure um, and seem to rely on that um, uh, more readily than uh, certainly electricity power plants do. Uh, you know, if you have a commitment, you 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 are on the hook for that commitment. There's no declaring force majeure. Um, so we'll get into some of that a little bit longer and I, I probably went down a rabbit hole a little too quickly, but, um. The, the, inter, the key, if nothing else, the interdependence between the 2 industries, um, is is high on everybody's mind. Um, heartened by the work that NERC is doing to try to to flesh out some of, um, and improve that relationship to ensure that we do have, uh, kind of energy security. I'm showing a couple of slides or a couple of charts here. Um, the one on the left is is a long time chart that that's been included in the ERCOT State of the Market reports. This uh, sort of uh, bright blue in the middle represents the natural gas share through the years, and and it has remained fairly constant. And you can see that on this this top chart here on the right. Um, the percentage is this red line and it really covers uh, right. It has over the last 10 years uh, on an annual basis provide get natural gas provides about 40% of total electricity inputs. Um, uh, you know, uh, consistently. I got curious about February in particular and thought that there might be more variability on a, in a February month, right? Versus, you know, cold weather versus not so cold weather. And that's what this bottom chart here is. It's just the, the input or how much electricity was generated from natural gas in February over in the Februarys over the last uh, 10 years. And this chart includes 2021, the top one does not. And, and I've showed a little bit of uh, my sort of quick estimate of how much more generation there could have been, but for the outages, how much more natural gas generation there could have been, but for outages. And you can see from a, the, the bar basis, uh, you know, just a tremendous uh, amount of increase in general in total requirements. Um, if that generate if generation and supply had been uh, had been available. Um, and speaking of generation supply lack of availability. Um, this, there have been a variety of charts that ERCOT has produced, uh, uh, so trying to summarize the various generator outages and durations. Um, this one shows that by fuel type, uh, over the, what I would call the frozen week, uh, starting Sunday, February 14th through Friday. And, and the important thing to take away here is just the, you know, the large volume of outages related to the natural gas fleet. And there at this point, ERCOT has published what I would consider to, to be preliminary data about the causes of outages. Uh, but I'm here to share with you as somebody who has worked with that data, it is a messy data set. It is um, the, the data that is the basis of some ERCOT charts that you may have, have seen uh, related to outage causes is not data that I would put a lot of faith in. And the real cause of outages has to be sussed out through, um, you know, kind of a more rigorous detailed discussion of uh, with the generation operators and that's what's happening now and that information 
I, I expect to become public uh, later this year. So at this point, the this is the kind of the net derations. Again, the point is natural gas derates were a big part of that. Some of that is going to be failures of the power plants, and some of that is going to be um, failures of natural gas supply. And at this point, I from my perspective, I I would uh, I would not put a lot of faith on how much uh, of each of those two types we actually saw. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another thing we saw was uh, natural gas prices at never before seen uh, levels. Um, I'm trying very hard not to use that uh, un word that seems to apply to everything at this point. But absolutely natural gas prices rose to levels that had never before been seen. Um, and uh, as high as and these are index prices, these are index supply prices for natural gas reaching $350 a million BTU at, at key delivery points. That's the Houston Ship Channel and Katy, which is the Houston area. The Katy, the Katy index is the is the index that's used for the basis for for much for some specific or top pricing outcomes. Uh, Waha is a West Texas uh, uh, location for those that may not be familiar on the gas side. Uh, but important to note, you know, supply is just one or the commodity is just one portion of natural gas. You have to get the gas to your power plant um, to actually be uh, able to generate. And these index prices do not reflect delivered prices to power plants. And although there's no good um, comprehensive or transparent data set that says what uh, you know delivered prices were at various locations. Uh, rest assured that they were very, much higher uh, than these prices, indicate, indicating to me, you know, not only a scarcity of supply but of transport as well. Um, the unfortunate. Um, um, this slide I, comes from the, the data here. I have some concerns with um, the information that the Texas natural gas industry is is uh, espousing publicly, and and these are these are quotes and a chart from a report that uh, was uh, chartered by the Texas Oil and Gas Association, Texoga, as we call it. Um, and and in this chart that I found the most helpful uh, piece of information provided was was the graph here, which shows um, their version of production and demand. And uh, if we just look at the at the purple line, uh, you know the production is sort of holding flat at 25 billion cubic feet a day, and then you start to see it dip. And this big decline here in the gray box. Well, this big decline was before February 15th. This decline started prior to there being any kind of issues on the electricity with the electricity system. And then that production stayed low for a while and stayed low and you know until issues on the electricity side were were mostly resolved, let me say, issues on the electricity side, we were out of emergency, let me say that, before they rose back up again. Um, and so, you know, their, their headline that the issues started at, at power generation units due to extreme cold weather um, doesn't seem to reflect the their own data. Um, and yes, the second quote I pulled out, even with these challenges, Texas natural gas production exceeded Texas demand during the storm, yet matching supply and demand proved challenging. Uh, that's an understatement. Um, we, everybody was having a hard time uh, matching supply and demand uh, for gas and for electricity. I, and, and even this, this comment here that you know there was plenty of production even with these uh, decreases, if we drop down to the to the green bars shown here, 
if there had not been all of those outages, gener uh, gas generation outages, this gap would have not, there would not have been a positive number here. Um, so just a cursory review of this public data is leading me to believe that there was not sufficient natural gas production capability to meet all of the demand. Now, again, it's a symbiotic relationship. The natural gas power plants got to be capable of producing and the natural gas has to actually get to that, those plants to be, uh, to be valuable. Um, and I, I, I would hope that we could get to a point where we're actually talking about both of those uh, aspects of, or both of those industries and how they work together. Uh, because we both need each other to uh, to be uh, successful. Um, it, I'm, I am not a natural gas expert, as Eric read off my bio, hope you may have picked up. I'm on the electricity side and have been for many years. And so um, I, I understand my limitations and, and potential biases uh, because of that. Um, but I do want to talk about kind of the Texas natural gas industry and the and the the difference between the interstate pipelines that are regulated by FERC and the intrastate systems that are regulated by our state commission, um, unfortunately named <laughs> um, as the Railroad Commission. Um, the Railroad Commission is a state agency uh, with, whose commissioners are elected officials, are responsible for uh, a lot of, of kind of health and safety aspects, uh, the permitting, inspecting of pipelines, uh, uh, requiring er, requirements for exploration and production. They do set rates for the local distribution companies. But things that that those in the FERC world may become used to on um, kind of open access and and codes of contact conduct between suppliers and, and transporters and the transpa uh, transparency of available capacity. Those things are not part of the intrastate pipeline system and and I and I think to its. It certainly makes it difficult to assess and understand um, those those issues and limitations. Um, just one last thought from the our railroad commission chairman, um, who's been very public that um, operators, the oil and gas industry was the solution, not the problem. Um, and so that kind of makes it hard or makes it. Uh, I'm concerned about the ability to kind of do real good problem solving if that's the the uh, the perspective of their regulator. Um, I won't tell you my interesting story about this picture, other than it's a pretty picture of the Texas State Capitol uh, during the event. So with all of its lights on, while many of us were in the dark. And I'll just show this slide here at the end of the variety of things that have been enacted. Um, related to, this is just a subset of everything that's been in legislation, but a subset related to that interaction between electricity and gas. And a lot of activities intended to try to, to, to force, really, the two regulators, the Public Utility Commission and the Railroad Commission, to work together on a variety of tasks. I think those are good, good steps, and, and I hope that that's a... Uh, productive and productive things come out of those efforts. So with that, I will pause and we have lots of other speakers with perspectives that I'm eager to hear. So thank you and I look forward to the questions. Thanks, Beth. So may maybe we'll do one quick one if, um, if, if you can, and there's a lot of other good ones here we'll save for the end, but I think uh, one here, just because you have the slide up, uh, there was a question about whether the legislature here um, do you think it will help in, in maintaining reliability? And there's, I think, some other questions about recent events and things like that. So if you, if you have any kind of a short uh, thought about that, I know it's not something you can have a short thought about, but um, <laughs> any, any kind of response uh, sure. to that. I'm happy to talk about that in more in depth. I would say that, yes, there have been uh, recent calls for conservation here in, in Austin with some hot weather, low wind conditions, many uh, power plants on outage still. 
uh, made for some tight conditions. Um, and then, you know, and with that, certainly public outcry over, hey, wait, I thought we fixed all of this. And, and my reaction to that is, is, as always, is a little bit more measured. Yeah, the legislature did some things. The actions that they took or the actions that they described and ordered people to take, I think are will be helpful, but nothing's happened yet. <laughs> I mean, you know, when people say, you know, we fixed the grid, I, I don't know what that means. And it's not like you, you know, snap your fingers and there's uh, all of a sudden new power plants installed or new uh, entities that have lots of money that they've invested. That that stuff uh, plods along slowly and, and uh, but progress is being made. Um, rule changes were enacted or approved this week just by, by ERCOT forward progress is being made, um, but none of these are, the problems are pervasive and complex. Those kinds of problems are not solved quickly. Great, thanks Beth. Um, so I think we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, and uh, of course, a lot of good questions on there that we'll uh, revisit during the Q&A. Uh, so next we have Derek Stenslick, who is a founding partner of Telos Energy uh, and is an industry leader in um, power grid planning operations and, and reliability. Um, Derek has over a decade of experience uh, helping clients across the uh, electric power industry uh, around evolving markets, uh, adapting to changing technologies, uh, as well as accelerating clean energy integration. Um, he has expertise in deregulated power markets, wind and solar integration, uh, battery storage, and resource adequacy. Uh, before Telos, uh, Derek spent uh, time at GE's Power Energy Consulting, most recently as uh, the Senior Manager of Power System Strategy. Uh, Derek holds an MS degree in Applied Economics um, from Cornell University and BA in International Relations uh, from State University of New York College at uh, Geneseo. And, and Derek's also I think, uh, leading the, the resource adequacy task force uh, at ESIG. So I think uh, we'll hear a little bit about what they're doing there and uh, some other thoughts about how to rethink uh, resource adequacy. So Derek, you should have um, control of your slides there and I look forward to the Great. talk. Thank you very much, Eric. And thank you all for participating. Really looking forward to the rest of this discussion and, and appreciate the panels that have already uh, kicked this off. So I think Mark and Beth really uh, went over some of the, the precursor work here so I can clip through some of these early slides. Uh, but what I wanted to do here is not just look at Texas, but wanted to compare and contrast what happened in February in Texas, apologies, there's a typo there, uh, but can compare and contrast the February 2021 event to the August uh, 2020 event in California. And I think that comparison and contraction, con contraction uh, is really useful for understanding how resource adequacy methods need to evolve and really look at this from not just kind of a root cause of what happened in these events, but really what it means for resource adequacy analysis more generally. Uh, as Eric said, I'm leading the ESIG Redefining Resource Adequacy Task Force. Uh, we'll, we're coming out. We've had a few deliverables thus far, you can find on the ESIG website, a webinar, some blog posts. Uh, we have a white paper coming out here shortly, I suspect here in July. So that, that covers a lot of these concepts. So again, uh, what can we learn about the California event and the Texas event? You know, not surprisingly, it's all about the weather. I think the, the thing these two events uh, have in common is we, we saw record breaking temperatures uh, in both events, obviously on multiple sides of the spectrum here. Uh, we had record breaking temperature in uh, the West. And again, this was a regional event. So you had a heat dome uh, that occurred across large swaths of the Western United States, uh, in, in the, especially in the desert Southwest, not very dissimilar to what we have going on currently in the Pacific Northwest. And I'd say from uh, California's perspective, somewhat fortunate uh, that at least for now has, has dodged some of that extreme heat. Uh, and then in, in Texas as well, obviously this again was record breaking temperatures, extreme cold, uh, and again, a regional event. So this is not isolated weather. This is across large swaths of the central United States. 
Uh, and in both cases, these were these were extreme, right? In the California example, it was a one in 30 year event. I think you have to go back about 30 years to get temperatures that high for that sustained period of time. Uh, maybe that's already broken again this year. Uh, the, and in Texas, you know, it's a one in hundred year uh, event in, in parts of Texas. So, you know, a question here when we start thinking about resource adequacy analysis is how should we or sh should we take into account climate trends in the analysis? Uh, are these events getting more frequent? If so, how do we still rely on historical weather observations, but do so in a way that we can uh, capture trends and what we are likely to see in the future, regardless of what's happened in the long-term historical record. And this brings up a separate uh, discussion about what a one in 30 year event means and what a one in 100 year event uh, means. Is that something we want to plan our system to, uh, to have to, to capture these extremes? And I think there's some questions going on in the chat now of, you know, why are we still using a one day and 10 year uh, loss of load expectation metric, should we use something else? And, and I'll get to that in a little bit, but just looking at kind of probability in a one in 10 may not be the best uh, indicator for how we should be evaluating this. And instead, maybe we wanna look at energy type metrics that really look at the magnitude of these two events. Because what we'll get to here is what we saw in California, while uh, you, know, you never wanna jeopardize reliability, nowhere near the extent and the extreme that we saw in Texas. And so, uh, you know, different metrics will measure these, these different events differently. So quick recap of what happened in California. Again, this was last August, uh, and we had two days actually of back-to-back uh, -back load shedding events in the evening. Uh, and Steve Berberich is, is on, and, and this is teeing up maybe some of what he's going to talk about. Uh, but here you had kind of this this classic issue of the the system is planning uh, historically with resource adequacy analysis is planning the system around peak load and I think Mark uh, talked about this a bit in his first presentation conventional resource adequacy planning very focused on do we have enough capacity to meet that peak load which in California occurs in in the middle of the day period of peak risk is now shifted into the evening hours. So lower load, solar has a lot of value there to shifting that load later in the evening and shortening the peak. But again, that resource adequacy procurement is still based largely on a planning reserve margin for, for the system peak load. And so what you saw is as the sun set, obviously, uh, some of the, the, the solar resources started to drop off and, and load stayed high. And so you had uh, some resource adequacy or, or, or load shedding events that took place in the evening hours. Uh, you know, I don't have the numbers offhand, but call it about two to three percent of system load, uh, and it rolled across the system for anywhere between 50, 15 minutes to 90 minutes. I believe part of the reason it lasted a full 90 minutes was because one of the breakers that was open had to go be manually closed, uh, and, and for the most part, the customer interruptions were relatively short, but still. You know, this was a, uh, a classic resource adequacy shortfall. It, it uh, was very political uh, at the time and, and caused a lot of disruptions. So contrast that with what happened in, in Texas. Again, we, we've already had a couple of panelists talk about this, uh, but order of magnitude different in the impact to customers. We're talking 20, potentially 20, 30 percent of system load dropped at times. Really hard to know. Uh, exactly how much. Uh, we saw over 20 gigawatts of fossil generation, uh, the natural gas, coal, nuclear fleet uh, offline uh, due to outages, several thousand megawatts of wind due to cold weather shutdown and icing constraints. So huge swath of the system on outage. Um, and, and again, this was a multi-day event. So three or four days of consecutive load shedding uh, at magnitudes we've really never seen before. So again, very different events, and from a resource adequacy perspective, how do we plan for this? Um, so first, I want to go back to just prior to these events. So as system operators, all of these folks are tasked with making sure uh, there's enough resources on the system. 
uh, to serve load. And so each of them will go through a seasonal assessment prior to that season's peak load to determine if there's sufficient capacity. I won't read through these excerpts uh, word for word, you have them, but I think it's very interesting to see from, a, from an analytical perspective what happened between these two events. On the left, you have an excerpt from the Kaiso Summer Loads and Resource Assessment. Again, this is about three months prior to the load shedding event. Um, and, and the tagline was, you know, Kaiso and, and the California entities believe they had enough capacity to serve loads through the summer. But uh, what I think is really interesting here is the, the Kaiso report really hit the nail on the head of what the resource adequacy risk was, why it was going to occur, where it was going to occur, how it was going to occur, and really looked at, you know, there was risk if there's lower levels of imports assumed late in the summer when hydro generation was at a lower uh, availability, later in the day when solar generation is at or near zero levels, and if a heat wave occurs. Uh, the impact impact a broader area than just the Kaiso, um, and so to me, from an analytical perspective, uh, the resource adequacy work was really targeting. It was it was capturing the risk. It was measuring it fairly well. Again, when we do these resource adequacy analysis, we don't design the system to go to zero loss of load expectation. There is going to be some probability of an event occurring. This the, the analysis you know captured that risk. Um, now, the separate discussion is, if, is that level of risk adequate or should we be de designing the system to be more, more stringent, but the, the methodology maybe captured the risk on the horizon well enough. Um, the other thing, you know, whether that this analysis here translates to proper procurement in California, that's a separate discussion. Still a lot of procurement in California is done on that planning peak reserve margin, um, not necessarily on this resource adequacy analysis. That's a discussion for another time. Flip to the ERCOT, uh, again, the seasonal assessment for resource adequacy. This was published in November, so a, a few months prior to the February event. And, you know, it highlighted there, there is risk of extreme volatility in the weather, but the, the tagline was sufficient generation to adequately serve our customers uh, and, and really no discussion of this possibility for a large swath of uh, the gas fleet going on outage. If you look at the way that capacity is measured, um, essentially gas capacity was measured uh, being available except for D rates due to forced outage. And so what can we learn from these events? Uh, again, very dissimilar events, but uh, I think a few important takeaways. One is not all shortfalls are alike. And it's really critical when we talk about resource adequacy metrics that we're able to characterize the size, frequency, duration, and timing of events. So right now, the vast majority of resource adequacy analysis is based on loss of load expectation and a criteria of one day in 10 years. And all that's doing is counting the number of times there, there may be a capacity shortfall and giving you a probability. Uh, but that, that is obviously inadequate when we're dealing with variable renewables, when we're dealing with energy limited resources. Uh, so really important that we start to characterize size, frequency, duration, and timing of these events. So we can make sure we have the right mitigations available. Second is the risk is shifting. So in both of these events, uh, the load shedding occurred outside of the traditional uh, peak load period. While they both occurred during very high loads uh, in California, it was later in the evening than the peak load. So again, the risk is not this the single peak load hour of the year. If you're okay there, you're not necessarily okay every other hour. We need to start looking across all hours of the year. Uh, in Texas, almost everybody looks at Texas as being, I mean, it's a summer peak system. Assume most of the risk is occurring in that summer peak. And again, the load shedding occurred well outside of that summer risk period that everybody's focused on. It's, does ERCOT have enough capacity during this period? So I think that's important. When we think about resource adequacy analysis, critical to look across an entire year. We can't just focus on the peak load hours anymore. Uh, the third, had a slide about this already, but weather, weather, weather. Weather is the single most important driver for resource adequacy. And this is critical. Uh, you know, I'm not a meteorologist. I think just as power system planners, we need more cross-disciplinary work around power systems and meteorological expertise. 
why this is why the eSig uh, this conference is so great is it's really focused on on bridging that gap. Um, we need better data. So right now there's still a lot of gaps in the data around correlated wind, solar, load, and temperature across many years of historical operation and uh, across wide areas. We have some good, great data sets like the NREL uh, National Solar Radi Radiation Database, the NSRDB, great North American wide solar uh, database that gives you correlated uh, data across the entire uh, continent. We're missing that level of data resolution for wind, load, and so on. Uh, climate trends obviously need to be considered. And when it comes to the weather, correlated events are, are the issue. Uh, and I'll, I can get into this a little bit more, but the fact that we're evaluating our, you know, our risk of generator outages being randomly occurring over the course of the year, that's not the risk that's gonna get us, it's these correlations. Uh, and then finally, resource sharing is really critical. So, uh, you know, in the California context, while it was a regional event, there was still um, a lot of surplus uh, capacity and transfers of energy going across boundaries of different balancing areas. So certainly helped out in the California context, certainly helping out right now in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so that's critical. In ERCOT, right, we have an electrical island. Um, and so a challenge there. Uh, so I'll set Steve up nicely. Steve's going to be on it in two panelists. I, I think he had a great quote just following the August event. Um, there doesn't have to be a trade-off between reliability and decarbonization. What caused the August blackout was a lack of putting all these pieces together, and we have to rethink the old ways of doing things. Um, and I think, you know, very good words. Steve can probably go over those in more detail in a couple slides, but I think the way I look at this in both events, not a renewables issue, not a challenge with the necessarily the transition to a decarbonized future. Critically, it's just the way we've done our resource adequacy and reliability analysis has not transitioned with the transition in the resource mix. And so why is resource adequacy broken? Uh, this is uh, something that came out of the ESIG white paper that will be out shortly. I hope you all can take a look at it. Uh, two items, chronology and correlation. I think uh, I can go over that at length in the white paper, but really when it comes to the ERCOT event, the correlation is really what got us. Um, weather, combined outages, climate trends, all of that caused a large swath of the generation mix uh, to go out uh, simultaneously. Now I had a few more slides. I'm gonna skip over them uh, mostly because uh, they've been either presented or will be being presented. I wanted to hit on six principles. These are, again, in the ESIG white paper, so I won't go over these in detail, and you may have seen them in a previous ESIG session. And the one I did want to go over, though, is metrics. So I do see a lot of uh, discussion coming in through the chat about metrics. Uh, so I'll breeze through it, running out of time, but our metrics really do need to go further. I mentioned uh, we, we rely too much on loss of load expectation, which is just counting the number of events. Um, and again, if you look at LOLE on a number of days per year or a number of events per year, depending on uh, how you measure it, uh, the California and Texas events don't look that different, right? The, the California event was two days back to back. Texas was four days. So from an LOLE perspective, you know, Texas was only twice as bad. Um, if you look at it from an events perspective of contiguous hours, Texas was actually better. It's not until you get into loss of load hours, you start to see these events differentiate, but really you look at expected unserved energy or EUE um, and the amount of energy that was unserved, vastly different. This is critical. I think this is important to go towards metrics that are actually measuring these uh, events. Um, we don't have to just use one. We can use multiple metrics. EUE is going to be critical. And we have to go beyond just looking at simple averages. So all of these metrics that we rely on today are averages across many hundreds or thousands of simulations. I think it's critical that we look at a full distribution of uh, uh, resource adequacy metrics. I see Chris Dent uh, in the, the Slido asked a similar question, not surprisingly, he was one of the co-authors on this white paper. Uh, and again, critical to go drill into these uh, capacity shortfalls event to understand size, frequency, duration, and timing. So understand what's causing the events, how big are they, how large are they, how long do they occur, and when do they occur. 
I think that's going to be critical for us, making sure we have the right resources to serve others. And with that, I will just skip to the very end. So thank you very much, uh, Eric. I'll hand it back over to you and really look forward. I hope this was a good introduction into uh, Michael and Steve's presentations coming up. Great. Thanks a lot, Derek. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll we'll move on to the next speaker. A lot of good questions on there that I know uh, Derek will respond to in the, the panel session later. Um, so next we have uh, Michael Goggin. Uh, Michael's actually pinch hitting for, for uh, Rob Gramlich uh, today, who uh, had a last minute um, related um, uh, activity that came up. Um, so uh, Michael was able to, to step in and sub for Rob. Um, and, and Michael is uh, vice president uh, with Grid Strategies and has been working on uh, grid and power markets for over 15 years uh, and is a graduate of Harvard University. Uh, Michael's going to talk a little bit about sort of the relation uh, with resource adequacy and transmission and some of the different ways that transmission uh, can support uh, RA uh, across the board, kind of uh, give, giving that uh, context. So, Michael, you should have the, the control there. And uh, yes, the floor is yours. Okay, right, thanks a lot, Eric. Um, and I think this is a nice segue from uh, Derek's presentation. It is all about the weather. And I think really one of the key lessons we're going to see here is that um, the grid allows you to um, have areas that are larger than the weather. Um, both of these events, you know, we've been talking about the, the California 2020 event. Um, the ERCOT 2021 event, and there's a number of other events we can um, also talk about, um, you know, the polar vortex events in 2019, 2014, the bomb cyclone in 2018, um, even the ERCOT 2011 event. And all of these, they were fairly um, large for a weather system in terms of their geographic scope, but the grid is still much larger than what these events were. And that I think is really key to seeing what um, I think was one of the best solutions Preventing um, reliability of um, out, you know, bad reliability outcomes in these events is making the grid larger and strengthening the grid we have, so that if you know you lose generation supply in one region because of you know gas system failure, because of equipment failures and extreme weather, and again this is not just a cold snap. Um, it can be extreme hot. It can be you know a hurricane. I mean, there's a number of things that can cause these, and all weather events like that have a limited geographic scope. Sometimes they're, you know, like the California heat wave, they're, they're large, they're, you know, they cover multiple states. Um, but I've never seen a weather event that covers the entire country um, with, you know, a similar intensity across the entire area. And so that's really, I think, where the transmission comes in is that the transmission allows you to aggregate supply and demand um, from an area that is larger um, than is being affected by the, um, the weather. And so yeah, it's critical on the supply side. Um, on the demand side, obviously, demand goes up when you've got severe weather, either extreme heat or extreme cold. And then, obviously, the same um, phenomenon and the same uh, factor is at play when we're looking at renewables. By making the grid larger, um, you cancel out those local variations in the weather, which helps you with the variability of wind and solar, but also um, you know the capacity value. Um, if you know the wind isn't blowing here, it's likely blowing somewhere else. You get time zone benefits or even north-south benefits with solar. Um, just because, you know, the sun is in a different position in the sky um, over the course of the day or the year. And so the, um, a larger grid is tremendously valuable for um, making it bigger than the weather, um, whether it's in these, one of these unique uh, severe weather events or just the everyday um, fluctuations in wind and solar output, um, as well as, you know, electricity demand. So turning to the events we're looking at here, this is a uh, chart from um, the morning of the February 15th, which is um, the Monday of the ERCOT event. Um, ERCOT's not on here, but um, their power prices were extremely high, um, as were those in SPP, uh, which is also not really reflected here. This is showing MISO and PGM. And I think there's a few things to take away here. Um, obviously, there's a very strong east to west price gradient here. Power prices in MISO were very high. Um, and then you can see that there's this interesting negative price zone kind of running across the MISO PGM seam in um, kind of the Illinois, Indiana region, and then relatively lower prices, you know, um, in Eastern PJM, you know, in the 50 to $100 range. And so this is saying, um, you know, basically there was a huge need for the ability to ship more power east to west. Um, however, this is not nearly as dire as the situation was in ERCOT. Um, you know, the power prices there were at about $9,000 per megawatt hour for about four days. Um, and obviously, you know, that was 
you know, they, there was, you know, as we just heard, you know, 10 to 20 gigawatts of unserved energy above that. And I think that's really a tale of, you know, two, you know, things were bad in MISO. There, there were rolling outages um, for, for a brief period, um, same as an SVP, but it's not nearly as dire as the situation is in ERCOT. I think that is in large part because of the degree of interconnectedness. Um, ERCOT has minimal ties to the outside world. Um, during this event, only about eight, um, 800 megawatts were functioning. Um, in the very initial part of the event, it was a little higher than that. It was like 1,300. Um, their tie to um, Texas, I'm sorry, the tie to Mexico um, was curtailed basically when gas supplies going into Mexico um, were cut off because of the event. And then basically tech, Mexico could no longer send power back north. So they were relying, ERCOT was basically relying on an 800 megawatt tie with STP. And even that was par partially caught when SVP um, ran into shortages and started having to deal with its own outages. Um, so ERCOT having those limited ties really put it in a bind. They had no um, nowhere to go to source more power. In contrast, MISO and SPP had very had pretty good, obviously you can see from the congestion here in this map, not as much as you would like, but they had pretty good transmission ties to power systems to the east that were not being as severely affected by this cold. Um, you can see on the, um, Derek showed the map of kind of the extreme, you know, the temperature anomaly associated with the, this event. And even if you go over to Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, temp the temperature anomaly was not that high. Um, TVA prices, and I, we have a report coming out in about two weeks that um, does a much more deep dive on the value of transmission during this event and other severe weather events. And there's going to be lots of numbers and, you know, power price data that and that. I, so check that out. But um, yeah, I can say that basically TVA prices during this week averaged about $100 a megawatt hour. You contrast that to the, you know, routine, basically for most of the week, $9,000 prices in ERCOT. There's obviously a tremendous amount of value if you had more transmission there. And it's not just a conceptual thing to say, oh, we could have had more transmission there. There are proposed transmission lines that would have done a lot of these things. Um, there's a the pattern energy has proposed the Southern Cross transmission line, which would run from ERCOT into Mississippi, um, potentially interconnecting to either Southern Company or TVA or another of the power systems there. Um, it's a proposed two gigawatt HVDC line um, that could have delivered $2 billion worth of power over the course of this four days. It's pretty straightforward math, you know, $100 on one end, $9,000 on the other end. Um, extremely valuable power would have, you know, kept the lights on for hundreds of thousands of people in Texas, kept the heat on, potentially even saved lives if this line were in service. Um, and we could we can build other transmission lines like that. Uh, there have been, you know, proposals to build um, from SVP to PJM, um, you know, SVP to the southeast. Um, both of those were clean line lines that have been since been bought by others. Um, so there are proposed transmission lines out there that would have really been tremendously valuable during this event. Um, we just need to be able to build them. And I'll talk about that in, um, towards the end of, you know, what we need in terms of policy to be able to build these. Um, and we've seen, you know, again, every weather event is different, and it's um, often these transmission lines, if, if one was uh, extremely valuable, in this case, you know, delivering power east to west, um, we saw the exact opposite in um, the polar vortex event in 2014, and in, in the bomb cyclone in particular, where the Midwest was, you know, the temperature anomaly was not that extreme. It was on the East Coast where, um, you know, the, the situation was most dire. And so you had the kind of the reverse power price gradient of, you know, Prices in Illinois were quite low, and power prices on the East Coast were, you know, 500 to 1,000 dollars. And in the bomb cyclone case, that went on for weeks, and so you had hundreds of millions of dollars of congestion in the other direction. And so it really shows, you know, that I think it underscores that the value of transmission over the long term during this event is quite high. It's unpredictable. Um, it is broadly spread. Everybody is going to benefit from having this lifeline in place. Um, quantifying exactly how much that's worth. You know, had freaking because these these are very frequent, infrequent events. It's difficult to kind of account for that and quantify. You know, what is the value of this? But if nothing else, it's an extremely valuable insurance policy that when such an event does happen, we even know what that event is or where exactly it's going to be. But having more transmission there is going to be extremely valuable, and that's often not accounted for in the um, you know transmission planning and cost allocation discussions. Um, you know how you know th these events are typically not accounted for. You just kind of do more routine production cost analysis, and certainly there's no valuation of the you know, the hedging or the insurance value that transmission provides for these types of rare events 
but which we are seem to be inc seeing increasing in frequency of. Um, so yeah, so moving on a little bit, um, the other studies have you know confirmed this. These, you know, I think there's a lot of literature out there coming up with you know, and ESIC has done its own work coming up with you know, looking at these different maps for transmission. You know, I think there's a lot of commonality in terms of identifying um, where the transmission is needed. As I mentioned, making the grid bigger than the weather is you know, is critical for these um, severe weather events, but it's also something we need to do anyway to make a high wind and solar penetration grid work. Um, making that grid bigger is how you get around the um, variability and the limited capacity value of wind and solar. And you can see that in, in the, the slide on the right, I think, is a um, the chart on the right is a great illustration of um, you know, the, the east, both how these transmission lines are bidirectional. Um, you know, the, this is from the uh, InRail interconnection themes study. Um, you can see the flows there swinging um, in the bottom chart um, in the high VG case. You've got a swing of 25 gigawatts. Um, basically, the west is exporting to the east when the solar output is high midday. And then at night when wind output in the east is high, it swings back the other way and the, um, you know, basically meets load in the west. This is how we're going to make the uh, a power system um, work at high renewable penetration. There's a similar, similar similar dynamic within the eastern U.S. You're going to have a lot of solar likely in the southeast, um, and so you'll be sending that power west and north in the in the middle of the day, and then at night um, the power flow has to reverse and the wind comes in from the west. And you know, um, I, I worked with uh, Chris Clock and others on a study that came out last fall, kind of illustrating where that transmission need is in the east and the, the, the magnitude of the flows is is extremely large just to you know on a daily basis the amount of power you're moving around goes up drastically and most of these studies have shown you know we need a two to three x increase in our total transmission capacity um, to make um, you know 80 90 percent wind and solar penetrations economically work um, and that's well, that's a lot of transmission so how do we get there um, so we've seen some success with the intra-regional transmission. Um, we know how to do this. Um, the, the, the key really in the, in the policy realm is proactive transmission planning and broad cost allocation. Basically recognizing that um, everybody benefits from having a stronger grid and then using that um, you know, to basically broadly allocate the cost to everybody. It's like what we do with highway systems, with water and sewer systems, with national defense. Transmission is a public good. Um, everybody benefits from it being there. It's often not. It's something that's going to be around for 100 years, roughly, when you build it. It's difficult to say over the course of that 100 years who's going to benefit precisely how much. We don't know what fuel prices and load patterns or even generation costs are going to be you know, in five years, let alone 50 years. Um, but we know it's valuable. Um, and it's probably more valuable than we think because it hedges against that uncertainty. And so, you know, I think really we found that the winning formula is to just broadly allocate the cost to all users. And, you know, when you're looking within ERCOT, you know, that's, that's you know, within a state like that, you know, it's, it's relatively easy because, you know, it's a single state. When you get interstate, it gets a little more complicated. MISO and SVP made it work. The MISO multi-value projects, um, you know, were kind of a, an exercise in log rolling where, you know, they built a portfolio of projects across the region that benefited all of the states, and so everybody was comfortable chipping in to pay for that. Um, with the you know movement in energy into MISO, I think some of that the politics has gotten more challenging. It's also challenging in, in regions like P, um, PJM, you know, where you've got um, very politically different states. Um, same in the West, and so I think you know there does need to be some federal role here to kind of realize these benefits. You know, they're very large and clear. And you know, step step in and basically allow us to pay for the public good of transmission. So what is um, yeah? So what can we do? So FERC can do a number of things. Um, it has pretty broad authority over transmission planning and cost allocation. And Chairman Glick has indicated this, this is his top priority um, for the for um, his chairmanship. So I think um, yeah, I think people are optimistic that a lot can be done in, in the near term. You know as quickly as, you know, a FERC rulemaking can be done. And I think that process has already started. There's been a lot of movement to, you know, begin the conversation with NARUC and others and, you know, kind of um, lay the groundwork for, I think, a, a rulemaking that can do, really do a lot to move things forward. Um, so we can do a lot, you know, within traditional transmission planning and cost allocation. Um, 
one of the values, one of the things we learned from the multi-value project in my um, projects in MISO is that you must look across benefits. In many regions, we um, look the, the planning is done within a silo of different um, transmission benefit categories. So you'll have your transmission planning for reliability, you'll have your transmission planning for generating interconnection, and you'll have your um, planning for economics. And most transmission lines do all three of those things. Um, but we, um, in most regions, we study them separately, and that's driven because of the cost allocation, depending on which bucket your line gets put into for the planning process, that determines who pays for it. And so all the fighting is over who pays for it, and that kind of steers projects. That's not the right way to do transmission planning. Um, you need to look across those benefits to optimize and make sure you're building the right transmission. And also, if you're not doing that multi-benefit analysis, you're undervaluing transmission. If you're looking at the value of a line only for economics or only for reliability, you're missing a large part of the value it has. Um, we, you know, I think there's a number of other reforms we can make to how transition is planned. You know, looking at longer time horizons. Again, these, these assets last extremely long. Um, we shouldn't be using 10, 20 year life, life frames to represent their, their value. Um, there's, you know, interregional transmission, obviously things are even more complicated. The current system is completely broken with regards to planning and paying for interregional transmission, there's it's not working anywhere in the country, um, in large part because of these fights over who pays for it. And you know, the planning rules are set up around that to um, kind of steer projects, um, any project that is politically contentious or you know, it's not clear who would benefit, it, it basically is, is not being allowed to go forward. And so we're seeing no real um, interregional projects moving forward in the current realm. And that can be fixed, FERC has that authority um, and, you know, can do interregional transmission planning and cost allocation. Um, and, you know, we, 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 an important thing is we should be planning for the generation mix. You know, we plan for load forecasts, um, particularly for things that are driven by state policy. Um, we need to be um, you know, incorporating that into the planning. So uh, one or two more slides. So um, we're, we're not only looking at FERC. I think there's a lot that can be done in Congress. And this is moving along well. You may get a little distracted by the um, back and forth in the news and what's going on, but I think the, the fundamentals are that um, there's likely going to be a very large bill passed through reconciliation, which is this obscure Senate practice that basically with 50 votes, um, the Democrat majority will be able to move forward a large bill that pays for a lot of things um, and does quite a lot. And there's a lot of talk about putting a number of transmission measures in there, including a investment tax credit. Um, there's even direct funding. There's even discussion of something like an acre tenant program where the federal government would come in, kind of like a loan guarantee, but they would be an early investor in a project and then they would be able to, in a transition project, and then they could resell that over time, kind of take the risk out of it um, and give the kind of the project the critical um, push it needs to get over the uh, started. And then um, as more subscribers come on, um, the government could sell out its position. Um, other loan authorities and um, you know, just DOE funding research. You know, I think there's a, you know there's a number of studies that DOE has done that have helped kind of um, move the ball in transmission. But there's more that can be done. I think with offshore wind in particular, um, designing those grids and just kind of you know laying out the benefits of transmission. I think kind of helps sell it. Um, obviously, you know, Congress directing FERC to do things and then funding states to um, participate in the process. Um, there's even citing stuff um, that you know can be done. Uh, here's a, a fair amount on this. So this map of the right is something that um, Rob and I came up with. These are 22 transition projects that we're calling shovel ready or ready to go. Um, this report came out a few months ago um, with some uh, uh, assist from the White House in promoting it. Um, and so, you know, with these some of the lines I talked about are on there, but basically, you know, the story is we've got a lot of transmission that can drive a huge number of jobs. We're talking, looking over a million jobs um, being created and could, um, you know, drastically increase our use of wind and solar, provide large consumer benefits. All that's outlined in our report on that, and um, federal action, um, the plan, the cost allocation, and then deciding some of the stuff you see here. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about what can be done through existing authority or new congressional authority to move transition siting forward. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's the end of my slides. So yeah, I'll take any, any clarifying questions and then looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Michael. I think we will move on to the last speaker and it uh, looks like a lot of good questions uh, for the for the panel as well. Um, but in the interest of time, I think we'll uh, move on to Steve. Um, 
so uh, the, the quick introduction, uh, Steve is the former uh, president and, and CEO uh, from uh, at the uh, California ISO. Um, and uh, Steve navigated the ISO through a series of major initiatives, including the world's most expansive integration of renewable resources into the power grid. Um, his vision for reducing grids reliance on fossil fuels has uh, catalyzed many significant programs, including the uh, Western Energy and Balance Market, uh, which welcomed uh, several Western states and utilities uh, into the ISO's um, wholesale uh, power markets. Uh, 35 years of experience in utility consulting, banking, and finance sectors. Uh, he also holds an uh, undergraduate degree in finance and a uh, MBA from the University of Tulsa. Uh, so Steve, uh, I think was going to give uh, sort of close the panel today by talking a little bit on you know some of the things that maybe we can look at going forward, including uh, market design and um, you know other um, mitigation strategies for these types of events and how to improve resource adequacy. And uh, we're we're looking forward to his his wisdom uh, to close out the session today. So Steve, uh, you know. 10 to 15 minutes, uh, you know, and, and we can uh, go into uh, the Q&A a little bit. I think we've got plenty of time. So um, uh, over to you. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that uh, introduction. Um, and uh, once again, I've seen why, why I tend not to use slides. One is because I think the, the people that preceded me do a, did a very good job of kind of uh, encapsulating some of the issues uh, that the system, the you know, the energy, the electricity system is facing right now, um, and so much ground has been covered. I will try to cover them uh, as best I can. And as Eric said, I was the former CEO of the California Independent System Operator, and I was the CEO during August events last year. I know them quite well. I was in the oper or in the control room while the operators are, were struggling with this. And I, I want to set a little context on this uh, just to defend uh, sort of the situation out there. The amount of load that was shed in California versus Texas, there was a thousand megawatts, I believe on the Friday night and uh, 500 megawatts on uh, the Saturday. So they weren't huge events by any stretch of imagination. But I did think they uncovered uh, the resource adequacy issue that um, I had been ringing the bell on for some time. And um, it kind of really highlights the difference between what happened in Texas and in California. And let me talk about that. Then let me talk about resource adequacy. And then let me talk about the role of uh, market design in that. Both, and I think Derek did a really good job of kind of highlighting what happened in Texas versus what happened in, in California. In California, um, and the quote they had for me was spot on because California's issue was one of, of planning, uh, a planning issue. Two things that were in, in coming and that we had highlighted. Keep in mind, for those of you who know the duck curve in California, that's 10 years old. The, that we had major ramps in the afternoon and tight conditions in the evening is not new news. And it was exacerbated by the, the, the fact that the coal and other big assets in the West have been, are in the process, have been and in the process of being retired. And so imports were under pressure too. And we highlighted that very event, not only during, when we talked about the summer assessment, but the prior year we had spoken to policymakers and regulators about the risk event in a high load period um, across the entire West and we would, we would have trouble, and we did. But uh, again, I think it was a lack of planning because um, as Derek pointed out, the resource adequacy program in California is designed to cover the peak load period. The peak load period is at four o'clock in the afternoon. The net peak period, which is the peak that occurs when wind and solar are no longer available, happens more closer to 7 p.m. And being resource adequate for that time frame was not properly addressed in the resource adequacy program. And until that gets done, I think California is going to be running tight. You have to provide for those evening hours when the load is still high and uh, solar is no longer available on the system. Texas 
um, I think is a different issue. And I know many of the leaders here in, in Texas as well. And I will highlight that the Texas issue was, I think, a matter of not uh, preparing the risk tail for a cold weather event because the system is designed for hot weather events. And I think both California and Texas highlight the fact that we're going to have to evaluate the risk tails differently. The one in 10 um, you know, risk of load loss situation is no longer uh, a proper metric. And uh, so resource adequacy has to be, has to be addressed um, as best it can. Let me further go into Texas. Texas resource adequacy is one issue about it. But the Texas issue was a complete breakdown in the whole supply chain. The electric system could not supply electricity to the uh, gas system. The gas system could not provide gas to the electric system. And you got this downward vortex of, uh, of, of trouble. So that's essentially what happened in Texas. And uh, I talked about what happened in California. So now California though has a different mode for resource adequacy. They have a resource adequacy system that, that requires the load serving entities to procure to their, their high load, 115% of their high load. As I mentioned, it's a four o'clock and that needs to change, but I won't go back over that turf. Um, in Texas, there is no resource adequacy program. It uses the energy market and high prices to incent um, investment. And I think in both in Texas and in California, I, the resource adequacy approach is going to have to be rethought. Why? Well, my task was to talk about market, market design. And I think the markets can be designed to help address some of these issues to incent um, availability and other kinds of things. But the markets were never the ISO markets across the nation. None of them provide enough, put aside Texas for a minute, the, the, the uh, markets across the, the nation uh, at least in the ISOs and organized markets are not designed to provide enough revenue for everything. Um, and that has to be uh, well established that the markets don't provide enough uh, revenue to the generators to fully cover their costs. So resource, they have to be complemented with resource adequacy. Now, the markets though, can incent for uh, scarcity and for all those things. And I think that needs to uh, be addressed. In California's case, the markets are evolving to handle dispatch of batteries. When do you charge and discharge? It's a resource adequacy issue and it has to be part of the market mechanisms to incent that. That's a focus. Distributed resources, Almost on, on some days, 20% of the load in California, 20% of the load in California is covered by distributed resources, which is very different than the rest of the system. And you must account for those resource adequate those uh, uh, distributed resources part of the market design. So California has been doing that and bringing those into the market as distributed resource providers and aggregators. Storage, as I mentioned when and how and to incent and disincent them is critically important. And then finally, getting the necessary attributes from the renewables that you used to get from the thermal system, I think is another critical attribute of, um, of system design. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, of, you know, of market design. So those I think are the highlighted pieces. I covered you know, the difference between what happened in California and Texas the role of resource adequacy and then market design. And um, Eric, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there and then we can go into questions. All right, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Steve. Um, so we've got um, a little under 30 minutes for our panel Q&A. So I'm gonna ask all of the panelists to uh, come back, if you will, to, to the video. And, uh, and show your faces uh, just so that we can get a, a great, uh, as close uh, as possible as we can to a, a real panel session. Um, there are a, a lot of good um, uh, questions that are that have been put on the chat. I'm gonna use a, a little bit of my um, 
moderator authority to uh, adjust them slightly to kind of help uh, give more of a, a panel uh, feel on on some of the things that folks have been uh, bringing up and then um, we'll kind of see uh, how far we can get into some of these and of course uh, we'll try to uh, see if uh, those that we can't get to um, the panelists will we'll try to respond to those offline and, and we'll try to have a copy of that um, so to start off there's a lot of a lot of questions on here related to metrics uh, so I'm going to kind of uh, boil that down and uh, and see what uh, folks have to say from from the panel on that. So, uh, Mark, there was a specific one for you on whether NERC is uh, is thinking about new resource adequacy metrics. Um, I see one here from from Chris talking about uh, looking at more uh, risk based uh, metrics rather than single numbers. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of questions around uh, the actual accounting. Um, assessments for individual technologies. Uh, I know, Steve, you'd have uh, some comments on, on that and others. Uh, I know, and, and of course, Derek, you had uh, quite a lot to say around uh, metrics too during your talk. So I might start with with Mark um, to, to give a few comments on on metrics from, from the NERC perspective, uh, and then we'll kind of go uh, from there from, from others that might have some comments. So, so more generally, where are we going towards um, you know, this sort of evolution of metrics for uh, planners, uh, for, for resource planners, for resource adequacy uh, assessment uh, folks on, on, on knowing whether you're, you're, you're adequate, uh, what metrics can help with that, uh, how do we, you know, use those, uh, what, what are different organizations looking at. So, Mark, I'll start with you, and then after that, I'll, I'll uh, open it up for, for others. Well, thank you for that, Eric, and certainly a, a very good question. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from my colleagues as well. As you saw what I was, when I was talking about the whole idea of, of capacity, which was this uh, outdated one in 10, and who knows if that number even make, makes any sense anymore, to be really around energy and, uh, and uh, you know, essential reliability services and flexibility, and, and perhaps we're going to need metrics for each one of those to kind of get us to a point where we're saying, okay, I'm comfortable. Now, how do we get to that comfort level? That may, re, may be a, something based on experience, very much like the one in 10 when, when Calabrese and, and the PGMers and all those folks worked on it in the 60s and 70s, and the kind of units they had back in those days compared to the kind of units we have now, and the localization. Uh, uh, so what's going to be an acceptable, un, uh, expected unserved energy level, perhaps in one part uh, of, of North America, may be a little bit different than in another part. But that I will say is that, yes, we are, as you saw, the third focus area is going to be in metrics. Once we have this other piece that's all kind of sorted out, uh, looking forward to working with industry because this is going to take, this is going to take uh, not just the engineer grinding stuff. It's going to take, you know, authority. It's going to take industry maturity to say, this is how we're going to do this going forward. This is where we're comfortable. This is the levels based on the kind of widespread long-term uh, impacts to potentially happen with these common conditions. How are we going to manage that system? And and there are things we could have done. Things around winterization, or things around operating operational planning, things around the 21 ruling uh, uh, plan that could have mitigated and, and the impacts of this kind of event. But to your point, still taking all those into account, what is a, a set of metrics that we're comfortable with? And I'm comfortable with risk. I'm comfortable with probabilistic analysis. And I'm comfortable with deterministic scenario analysis, which all of those things I think can feed into our comfort levels. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Uh, any, anyone else uh, want to go next? Just uh, metrics generally. What metrics should we be using, et cetera? Yeah, I, I, I've got a couple of thoughts on that. And one, it, it, it's the, I, you know, we all need to, have, I think, evolve away from kind of the central planned utility providing all customer needs. And part of that risk and, and part of the challenge I think we face is trying to understand where, you know, where does the, where does the bulk electric systems uh, responsibilities end and how are customers able to manage their own exposure and their own risk? And how do we, how do we identify that? How do we appropriately plan for it? Um, those are those are tough problems. You know, it's way easier when you can draw the line around. Well, I'm responsible for everything, and therefore I'm going to spend money and resources and and time and, and and to make sure that I do everything I can for that. But we're we're evolving to a 
to a world where certainly many customers, big and small, um, have the ability to kind of manage their own exposure and how do we factor that into this adequacy discussion is, is certainly a question I have on my mind. Yeah, thanks, Beth and Eric. I, I can maybe add <laughs> to the metrics discussion a little bit. I, I did touch on a lot of this during my talk, so I won't go replow those fields. Uh, but there's a few takeaways. I think when we went into the ESIG task force on resource adequacy, we, we went in guns blazing and we said, we're going to come up with the new metric. That was like when we started, we said, we want to replace one day in 10. And I think we've tempered those expectations really because I don't think we need new metrics. I think we just need to use the metrics we have better. Uh, there's a few things we can do right off the bat. I think Planning reserve margin based solely on peak load, you know, 15% above and beyond peak load, that's dead. We just have to get rid of that, retire it completely. Loss of load expectation, still useful, but does it deserve a pedestal of the only reliability criteria that's used across 90% of North America? Probably not, so useful. Continue to use it, but give it a lot less emphasis. And then I think it's going to be coming around and, and having multiple metrics making sure we're doing that analysis, and then making sure we're not just looking at the average value, not just the expected value, we're looking at the distribution. Um, and I think, you know, we have to look at system planning to say, okay, what is our average, you know, what's our likelihood of a uh, shortfall event? But then to Mark's point, making sure we still do that scenario planning, say, what if we have an event that looks like X, Y, Z, how do we prepare for that? What are some commonalities? Is, is the Texas event, are there other ways that that could permeate through to a similar event, like a cyber uh, attack or something similar? And I think that type of scenario planning is still going to be critical, even if we can't put a, a value on it. And then lastly, um, you know, the one day in 10 years, that was always arbitrary. And one of the things I always uh, had a lot of discomfort in is people rarely understood, people being regulators, policymakers, the average stakeholder, rarely knew what that was costing them. And so I'm not necessarily advocating for a change in the reliability criteria per se, but just make it transparent. Say, this is what it costs us to get to one day in 10. This is what it costs us to be one day in five. This is what it costs us to be at one day in 20. Make sure people have the information to make those policy decisions. Because ultimately, this is really complicated. It's about evaluating risk and the trade-off of more money and more investment and more risk. And, and so right now that's just being done with a line in the sand and we say, well, the system's either reliable or it's not reliable. Uh, it's not that black and white. At, at the risk of dominating this conversation, that that that's exactly the point there, Derek, is that, <clears throat> you know, what is the cost that we're spending for reliability and different customers are going to have different thresholds and and differentiating um, that I think is is going to be a challenge going forward. I, I think of an additional layer here, and that is that there may be some consumers that have high value of electricity, but can't afford it. So we have to figure out, I had a conversation with somebody in the gas industry, well, they said, why don't they fire up their gas fireplace? Not everybody's got a gas fireplace. So we have to think about how we manage this, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, leave it up to the end consumer. They may not be able to afford those kind of solutions and the social solutions of electricity and gas working together, I think provide those kind of solutions. And so, we, you know, we have to look at the cost then, not only like, I, I like what you're talking about as far as the one in five and all that understanding of cost, but there's another cost, and that's that human element. We can't we can't lose that as well. You know, if I could step in here a second, I think we have to completely rethink this conversation because I I've lived outages. <laughs> One in ten outage is not okay. Um, outages in general on the bulk power system are not okay ever, and not only that. As we move to a more electrified economy and society, that even becomes more acute. And, you know, I can tell you that, again, 1,000 megawatts on 50,000 megawatt system for 90 minutes, 500 megawatts on a 50,000 megawatt system for an hour. 
And the last outages we had in California were back, you know, in 2000, 2001. So in 20 years and the world nearly came to an end. So I can tell you from a, you know, we're always going to have ice storms and thunderstorms and tornadoes that come through. Everybody gets that. That'll take out elements of the distribution system, potentially part of the transmission system. But bulk electric outages are politically unacceptable. And whatever metric has to come into play, I think is something that we have to get our arms around. All right. Uh, I, I I see a couple other questions here that I think would be also good to bring to the to the panel discussion. Uh, so there's a few around. Uh, so someone asked, you know, sort of what's the um, you know existing market constructs? Uh, are they are they fit for a changing resource mix? I'm going to broaden that because there's a few other questions on there too. And given that this is uh, a forecasting and market design workshop. So, you know, we know that there's different mechanisms um, in the market regions for um, achieving resource adequacy. There's, you know, centralized capacity markets, there's voluntary capacity markets, there's bilateral um, LSE requirements, uh, and then there's, of course, the energy only market. Um, and, you know, our it, resource adequacy wasn't, I guess, I, yeah, you know, maybe two years ago, or or at least definitely five years ago, people weren't really talking about resource adequacy. Maybe you hear a little bit here and there. You know, I know it was always talked about in in Texas, um, but it wasn't the big topic. We were talking about, you know, grid services and and other things. But you know, now that we've seen some of these events, we know that they're they're happening. Are there things that we can do to the market design? That you know, large scale or small, you know, tweaks, whatever that may be, that we think can help provide these solutions. Um, some that maybe we've talked about, some that maybe haven't been. So uh, I know Beth, you've got a lot of thoughts on this. So I was, I was thinking of maybe starting with you. Uh, maybe after that, uh, Michael, I know you've you've thought a lot about this as well, and then we'll kind of see what others uh, have to say after that. Excellent. Yeah, the, the, for me, uh, living through now three sort of winter events here in Texas, um, the, my first step is we've got to, we have to stop operating the same under summer conditions and winter conditions. They are, the impacts under those two conditions are different and require different sets of preparation and different sets of tools. So that, that's kind of my, my baseline fundamental at this point. <clears throat> I think the, you know, the idea, I, I think there is, I, there's even after the February catastrophe, there is not a stomach for an installed capacity, traditional installed capacity market here in Texas. So we're, that's, that's not an option that we'll see here. I do think, however, that there are opportunities for uh, call them expanded ancillary services, which we'd probably have to do to, you know, be politically tenable. Um, you know, expanded kind of capacity services. Maybe they're seasonally based. Maybe and and those discussions are underway right now to try to lay out what that might look like. Um, and that's some of, in fact, some of the legislation kind of directs those those discussions to occur. I'm leaning toward kind of an expanded, shorter term capacity type of market. I'm also thinking about um, how just the way we procure ancillary services now, uh, which is basically day ahead, we buy some capacity for tomorrow. Thinking about that, well, what if we just bought ancillary services uh, further ahead, you know, a season ahead or a year ahead. What does that look like? And what kind of certainty does that bring to the supplier of these things that we need? Um, but I, you know, I think it was Mark that said it very early in our discussion. It's, you know, we have to shift away from just buying capacity and be and shift toward being clear about what is it that we need to ensure the energy adequacy at every point in time. And you know, being more specific and clear about what it is we need for that, procuring those things um, 
using markets, you know, let's use markets to procure them instead of just telling power plants what they have to do and then paying them what they say they need um, and, and moving forward in that direction. Yeah, a few thoughts. I mean, we've seen events, you know, across the last decade that have occurred in a number of these market structures. You know, they've occurred in regions with capacity markets and regions with the energy only market and, you know, kind of vertically integrated IOU, um, you know, traditional planning. So there's, you know, really it's not a market design issue, I think, you know, with, and, you know, what happened in ERCOT, having, you know, $9,000 per megawatt hour power prices, you can't have a stronger performance signal than that. And you know, I think we have capacity markets that tends to mute those incentives you get. And you would have had a similar, you know, like we saw it happen in PGM and the floor vortex, you know, the gas plants um, that were getting capacity payments just didn't show up. They um, had the same gas supply issues. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's, um, it's more, I think, looking at the gas system and um, translating the power incentives, the power prices through to the gas system. And I think Beth mentioned earlier, you know, the gas system is much, gas suppliers are much more um, uh, comfortable declaring a force majeure event and kind of, just, you know, relying on that for these extreme events. And that's not something that the power sector does. And I think we need to have, you know, I think pricing all the way through that basically flows those incentives through to the gas suppliers and you know, the pipelines and you know, basically makes sure that they're making investments so that they can deliver and, um, you know, they're reaping the rewards if they do and paying the penalties if they don't. I think that's um, really where we've seen the failures is mostly on the gas side. Um, you know, with the incentive structures we now have on the power side, particularly in places like ERCOT, um, I don't know what else you can do. I mean, the, the, there there's certainly some rumblings that as you look at the different levels of natural gas pricing across the country during the February event, uh, there's there's certainly a correlation between higher gas prices in ERCOT and our much higher system-wide offer cap on electricity. And so that raises the question of, of you know, does our high energy price enable uh, natural gas suppliers to extract more value than may exist in other markets where, you know, the electricity guys can only sell their output for one or $2,000 at the most. And so that puts a natural limit on what the gas suppliers can provide. Um, and clearly if you have a, you know, there's a former market monitor, I'll just say, you know, if you don't have oversight and rules around that say it is illegal or um, against the rules to, uh, manipulate the market through withholding of supply to drive price up. Uh, if you don't have those rules, those are profit incentive <laughs> activities and people will, you know, will uh, follow their profit incentive and, and potentially uh, do those kinds of behaviors. Behaviors that we have declared um, uh, illegal uh, or against the rules on the electricity side don't have the similar kinds of uh, limits on the natural gas side. Um, any other thoughts there? Uh, or I'll go to the next uh, topic. Um, so there, there's a couple comments in the, the Q&A here around um, load shedding as, uh, as a solution, uh, which uh, we all know is, uh, so, you know, that, that really is a, a solution uh, and, in terms of even in the ERCOT case, uh, avoiding uh, a larger scale uh, blackout. Um, and so I'm going to kind of pivot the question a little bit differently from what I see in the chat to say, is there is there more education uh, that we need to provide to consumers about, you know, sort of, you know, how that's how to anticipate these types of events? Uh, what to expect, and and that could be a couple of different things. I think you know education in terms of is that helpful for understanding that these types of things can happen, uh, or or to understand you know what they should do if they if it does happen, or you know and, and some examples that you know obviously there's the flex alerts and and uh, that education of trying to help out, um, but also just the education around you know, consumers in Texas getting very high bills and not understanding things like what does uplift mean or what, you know. So I guess what, what kind of education uh, is needed for, for your everyday consumer regarding, um, you know, uh, rolling outages, 
um, electricity markets, et cetera? Is there more than that we need to do? Mm -hmm. My my, uh, sorry. I I'm always I always want to be the first to speak. So uh, you guys got to have to move faster to get behind to get ahead of me. Um, the I'm not sure how much regular consumers want or care. Uh, as uh, to quote Robert Bryce, it, you know they want cold beer and air conditioning, and they pay a bill to get that. And so I'm not sure how much education is required, I think there is an opportunity to improve the communication channels. And that was really the failures of those were really in play in February. And you had ERCOT, this organization who is not, you know, not known for geared for direct customer communication. But that's where the source of ed, of information was, and we didn't have a really good, clear uh, communication pa uh, path out to end use co consumers, and so they were confused and scared and cold and dark. Um, and so, trying to figure out how to how to improve that as we have, and certainly in ERCOT's case, have balkanized the system in, from a you know in the from a you know for competitive reasons. Um, We've broken some of those communication chains. So, um, yeah, let me and let me add because I worked for an organization that that did load shed. Um, we, I mean, we deployed flex alerts and 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 calls for conservation on a fairly regular basis, particularly in the summer. And I think I think that's ineffective, and I think education should occur around that because I think, you know, conservation, demand response, all of those things can play a critical role in ensuring the reliability system. And so you should absolutely invest in that. And I think that should be part of the narrative. However, um, I completely agree with Beth. Um, and I'll add one other point. One, the first point, yes, I, I think that people want, they want cold beer and they want their air conditioning. And well, in this case, their heat um, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the winter. And, you know, and I've seen polling on this, people spend, you know, we're all, we all live in this space, but you're, you're, you're normal. I'll call them normal people. Don't really think about it. They turn on their electricity and they want to know what their bill is. And that's, you know, there are those that care about the environment and things like that. And I don't, I don't want to diminish that, but I mean, fundamentally, that's what they're after. So I don't think further education about, Hey, this is why we do load shed. They don't want you to do load shed. Um, and I can also tell you this, the political spectrum does not want any load shed um, ever because it's very hazardous to them. And um, having been on the receiving end of their displeasure, um, I, I can absolutely attest to that. So I, I don't think there's a lot of uh, mass um, communication. No, Beth didn't mention, she kind of touched on this, but let me just say one other thing. I will, customers have no business getting real time pricing no business. They have no way to risk uh, mitigate that. Um, they're at the mercy of the wholesale markets that are very uh, volatile. So I think what happened in Texas with Gritty was, I mean, that is one thing. And I, I know they've made, they take, they, they've made a stop to that, but let that be a warning to across the nation. Um, you can't expose retail customers to wholesale prices. I, I, I would, I, I'm okay if you limit your comments to residential customers. I think there are. Yes, I agree. Lots. That's what I mean. Yes, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah, Walmart can hedge it. They can figure out what to do. Exactly. And even, well, anyway, um, I, I, I think the, in terms of communication there, I think about the difference, certainly here in Texas, if you live on the coast of Texas, you know what to do when there's a hurricane watch versus a hurricane warning versus an evacuation order. You you know, we've we have frequent and constant communications about that and people know how to react and respond and what they should do to prepare and react to that. A similar level of awareness does not exist on extreme cold weather because we don't get extreme cold weather very frequently. And so uh, some of the legislative language directs some improvements about that winter uh, preparedness, winter communication. Um, don't run your garage or don't run your car in the garage. Don't try to heat your house with your gas stove. Don't, you know, those kinds of things that 
that basically had tragic outcomes uh, for some citizens of Texas. Yeah, and I don't mean to have uh, Beth and I uh, monopolize this part of the conversation, <laughs> but let me add. Let me add just one other thing. This this country, and frankly across the globe, is moving to electrified transportation. So, not only are you going to not have your power, but your cars aren't going to work either. So, as we electrify more and more of the infrastructure in this country, we're going to have to consider that as we consider our our metrics and the way we approach reliability. Well, it, it, you're, you couldn't put gas in your car either because the gas pumps. No, are there is that. So, so yeah. there is that. Yeah, I, I mean, one, one, of the, one of the things I haven't talked about, and I, just to drop this in here, from a decarbonization standpoint, and the you know some some efforts to try to reduce uh, home use of natural gas. You know, one of the ch demand challenges here is is the just pervasiveness of electric heat. Most of the time, that's high efficiency heat pumps, and most of the time, they are high efficient. But but when you get down to freezing and below, you now you know those those devices switch over to old fashioned strip heaters that can put a demand that's you know two, three, five times what your air conditioner is. And so that, you know, it's that kind of, of um, that's the de demand draw. And, and I'm, I'm worried about how do we, you know, if we're moving more and more toward electric heat, how as a, in a temperate climate, are we going to manage those potentially rare and very extreme um, uh, high electricity demands? I well, uh, hate to uh, stop the, this great conversation. This is normally when uh, everyone would go to the bar and you'd find your favorite panelists and, and start asking them all these great uh, questions or tell them, you know, oh, I've got a, a better idea here. But uh, unfortunately, we'll have to wait till the next ESIG event uh, for that. So uh, I wanted to give Charlie a couple minutes just to, to close this out. But I did want to uh, thank all of our panelists uh, today uh, for a great session. Uh, I really thought that was, uh, you know, great great way to cover, um, you know, a, a, a lot of topics related to to resource adequacy. And and I'll mention uh, we'll do our best to try to take some of these uh, specific questions um, and try to put those on the ESIG website along with the um, uh, the presentations uh, later on. And I think Ryan will let folks know about that. So Charlie, I'll let you. Uh, close this out. So thanks everybody for attending. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again, Eric and the panelists. It's, it's really been quite a fitting conclusion to our forecasting and markets workshop and all good things must come to an end. And we're now at the end of the workshop. We've uh, covered the gamut from climatology to meteorology, to forecasting, to market design and system operation during this past month. And We'll continue through the summer with our monthly GPST and ESIG webinar series, and you're all invited to attend those as well. Further information on the registration is provided on the ESIG website at esig.energy. So thanks again to our panelists and participants. Stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you again soon, if not on the monthly webinars, then in Austin, Texas in October. Take care. Thanks, Charlie.